Hello everyone, and welcome to the South by Southwest Sessions online series. My name is Monica Sack, and I am one of the programmers for South by Southwest Conference. Today, I am honored to introduce TV host, philanthropist, and cooking legend, Rachel Ray. She will be in conversation with Austin American statesman, food writer, Addie Broyles. In this session, Rachel and Addie will discuss how COVID-19 has affected our relationship with all things relating to food, from grocery shopping, to cooking at home, to creatively sharing meals during quarantine life, I am really excited to hear some tips on how we navigate these interesting times. Side note, if you haven't checked out Rachel's Italian sangria recipe, maybe look that up. It's absolutely delicious. And now it is my pleasure to virtually welcome Rachel Ray and Addie Broyles. Rachel, it's so good to see you. Welcome to my kitchen. Ta-da! And your home office. And my studio, my home office. Yes. All the things. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. Beaming anything virtually. Anything for you, Addie. Oh, you're the sweetest. Yeah. Well, anything to virtually have you here in Austin. I know this is your home away from home. No, I really broke your heart so to not be here. <laughs> I know, I miss it so much. And, you know, I, uh, I didn't ever say, okay, we're, we're dropping out of South by Southwest. I left it up to the city and, and to Austinites, to people that live there, to be the guy to that. Of, uh, of course, I sensed that it was coming. Um, and even after the day came and went, I was like, well, maybe we could just drive down and be supportive to the community. You know, like it, it, it was, I really felt um, a, like a, a loss, you know, not, not being there. I've been doing it for so very long. I've been going to Austin for 20 years and we've been doing that show for over a dozen years. And it was, it was literally, it was a real heavy emotional hit. I, I, miss, I miss my second city. Yeah. I, I do I do get to watch Bob though. Bob Schneider uh, does every Monday night instead of from the Saxon, he does the Bob Schneider Song Club, Bob Song Club. So I, I have been uh, and we've done a couple of cook alongs with the family. So I feel like I'm I'm trying to to live vicariously through my friends that live there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean it's so appropriate that you talk about that. Cause this whole season it's just been loss. I hate to say loss upon loss because there have also been gains. But just with change comes this sense of the lack of normalcy. I mean, and I felt that as soon as we got the directive to work from home, I got home and the first thing I thought of was what's in my pantry, what's in my fridge, what's in my freezer. And it got real. Like, so I would just love to hear a little bit about what that transition was like for you to move home and be making those decisions. The transition for me was different than that. I know what's in my pantry at all times. I'm an obsessive list writer. My grocery list every week, I write on big blue sheets of uh, these notebooks um, that I use specifically for writing uh, grocery lists and for drawing furniture. Uh, otherwise, I use composition notebooks for recipes and stuff. Anyway, I always make these long laundry lists and I keep a running list here and in my apartment. When pantry staples run out, I, I make a note of that so I can buy six more canned tomatoes or you know six more spaghetti or whatever it is. Uh, if I run out of canned beans or dried beans. So I was kind of on top of that. The transition for me was much more emotional. You know, I've tried for 20 years to, to roll as real as possible, both at Food Network on, on 30 Minute Meals and at the daytime show, in that we keep it as, loo you know, as loosely or unscripted as possible. 30 Minute Meals was always, as you could tell, <laughs> evident by watching it. Um, that we, you know, everybody saw the messes and the successes and when things came out perfect or not so perfect, we left all that in there. The daytime show, you know, we try and keep it as loose as possible, but it had more, certainly more structure than what we do here. Now it's just myself and my husband. But the transition was that mental uh, switch that I had to flip. I have said for years and years and years, no, I will not film any sort of special or interview or allow magazines, uh, you know, from architectural to pop culture. I don't want 
any of that in my home. That's This is my private space and I am as open as I can be when I'm at work, but I don't want to give up my my safe place. This is like my fort, you know, my, this is where I come to do my quiet work and my writing and where you don't uh, wear makeup or clothes that aren't yours and where I think about and spend time with myself and with my family. So it was an extremely emotional thing to begin filming from here. That first day I said, welcome home, everybody. Welcome to my home. And my eyes filled, you know, they welled up and I thought, don't lose it. I almost had a breakdown at the top of the show because I was crossing a very, very serious line for me that, you know, that has been my line in the sand for 15 years, literally. Um, so that was weird. And then over the course of the next several weeks, it became, I don't want to say lucky, there's no silver lining to the world suffering a pandemic. But uh, I found the grace in it and it, it gave me more than it took from me. And it became a really cathartic, wonderful thing to have work from here while my dog was so old and so sickly. Isabu's last three months of life, we were with her around the clock every minute. And that was such a blessing. As I told you privately, there are hundreds of thousands of people in the world who had no one with them when they passed and had no ceremony when they passed. My dog died in my arms, um, listening to Bob Schneider, as a matter of fact, on the soundtrack, because she's known Bob for years. My husband played her banjo all morning. She died in her own backyard with sun on her face. And I knew she was gone. I felt her like pass right through me. And I might not have even been home or at the hospital or wherever had I been at work or filming or taping or in a studio. Um, my mom is 85 and I'm across the street from her. So I think she's felt more secure that I'm here. Um, you know, I feel strangely now that we've become over the last several months, and I mean we, because John and I are the only ones here and he's become a large part of the content in the show as well. I and we have become much closer to our audience than ever before in that we answer so many uh, more questions. We, we have this dialogue that's going on and a sense of intimacy uh, that, that I don't think we've ever reached with our, with our brand and our viewers and our readers. Um, and that's also a blessing, you know, and showing people who you really are, you know, standing here in, you know, a, a, a t-shirt in my kitchen with no show makeup and fancy hair and expensive clothes. It's, it's, it's strangely freeing. Like it really does free you of so many things. You know, it allows you to just get down to what you are really doing more so than ever, what you want to say, how you want to be, uh, and, and what you're cooking. Everything seems turned up to me, like in Spinal Tap, when they say turned up to 11. I feel like working from here has turned my creative energies up to 11 and allowed me not to worry about things that I didn't care about to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, crisis comes from the Greek word to sift. Yes. So it's to sift through. all the things and what remains is what's really important. And you've just named a lot of those things, family, <laughs> community. Yeah, the virtual community that is there supporting you. And um, so, you know, we, we titled this session kind of maybe six weeks ago or something, because I was thinking a lot about how the pandemic had caused me to order food for delivery, not takeout, but groceries for delivery. And I just had never done that because I love grocery shopping so much. Um, can you talk a little bit about the practicalities of getting food, for, you know, yes. planning food? I mean, you have always cooked so much for you and John. That probably hasn't changed very much. Well, but everything has changed. And the way I procure food has changed. First of all, I am an obsessive list maker, but I think everybody right now has had to learn those skills to some extent. The day I started cooking from here, we came up here in May, uh, I mean, March 11th, I think. Was it the 11th or the 12th, John? Well, you come on over here, come with me. So we it came- right, It was right when they announced that there was no basketball, no hockey, and Tom Hanks we, got COVID. And yeah, Tom Hanks got COVID that week. I, yeah. Hi, how are you? So- oh, it's great to see you. 
See, Addie. So we made a list of everything that we put into the fridge and the freezer as it came into the house, which has been really essential. And then we tick it when we take it out and reorder it. And we started looking collectively, uh, myself, John, uh, Michelle Boxer, who you know, uh, it, my friend, Andrew Kaplan, who runs our kids initiative, anybody that we knew that was a foodie, where do you, where do you get this and where do you get that? All the things that I would normally go to Chelsea market for the union square green market, uh, the, the, the circuit, I went online to see how many of them shipped. And it's amazing, like Fulton fish I can still get and I could get it here. And if you order X amount of seafood, they send you like bonus salmon. Like you get a lot of great deals online. So we do, I would say 80% of what we need to online. And that is a whole new world. The pricing is fantastic. Um, you can get everything you know, Kalushian, it, it had a little bump there where for a while they, they didn't know when it would ship, but they would keep it on the list that you wanted that thing. Right. But I mean, I can get curry leaves, every spice on the planet, any kind of seafood. Uh, you really can't find anything online. And in some cases at better prices than I was paying in person, walking, physically walking from store to store to pick it up myself and going home like, you know, a donkey coated in sweat, you know, now it comes to the back door. It does take up hours of our day every single day. Uh, we have a system, John cuts open the box. I'm outside, I cut open the box. He does I wipe the first wipe down, down, then he throws it to, it to me, then I take it inside and process it. If it's meat, I break it down into smaller individual packages. So it can be pre-portioned when I take it out of the freezer. Produce goes to the sink, we wash it. <laughs> the sink gets filled up with water midday every single day. Oh, we have a guest. Everything goes away clean and ready to use, which is a great tip forever and ever, not just now. If you put everything away clean, processed, and ready to use to the best of your ability, you cook more fresh food. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. And, oh, hey, hey. oh, you don't want to be up. You don't want to be up. Yeah. What a beautiful new addition to the family. Yeah, that's, that's this is Bella Boo Blue. Blue. She's blue. But she's got the hiccups. That's why she doesn't want me to pick her up. Mm. I can feel her little tummy skipping. She's been eating. We oh, give her okay. ice cubes. She chases them around the room like it's a toy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> she's got hiccups. She doesn't want anybody to pick her up. Uh, she chases ice cubes are her favorite toy. That's, you know, it's the simple things in life. It's like little kids or a cat when they get a hold of the wrapping paper in the empty box. They're like throwing in the box. Yeah. Hey, so yeah. I want to ask you how you're getting produce. Um, have you been able to, you know, sign up for some sort of like CSA or because yeah. locally, well, all the there's, there's uh, a man. Oh, she's about to pull the computer right on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there S N O S. My friend Kevin, he has a farm and he uh, would sell at. Union Square, he had the best prices in all of Union Square Green Market. Um, he ships if you do a, a big case, um, I think it's 25, 30 pound. It's limit. heavy, yeah. But 30 pounds, you know, at the produce department, say if I went to a Whole Foods or something, wouldn't get me very much. Here, I get a case I can't even lift of farm produce. Uh, we garden, um, we have a lot of groundhogs this year, so it's been a real struggle to get the garden up and going. Um, I feel like a little bit like Bill Murray and Caddyshack, but we try and grow as much as we can. Uh, and Chef's Garden is also a great resource. We get a lot of fun produce from them. And I, I kind of just write them and say, hey, what do you got that's good this week? But there's a lot of people that are shipping uh, great produce, again, at really great prices. Um, and my sister, who's staying up here to help uh, with my mom and, and with everything with our business, she has uh, like a little local network and she'll call the stores and the markets ahead and say, did the order come in today? We know each store, like this store comes in on, gets their main produce delivery on Friday. This store gets it on Tuesday. So between all of us, we have like a, kind of like a network, <laughs> like a food underground or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you know, all of my friends, um, all of my friends for their engagements and birthdays and everything they've been celebrating, 
I've been sending them mystery boxes of produce and it's like the greatest gift in the world. They are like so excited to them. It's like a diamond ring. <laughs> that was so amazing. Um, just maybe two weeks into this, my neighbors and I uh, immediately started almost a, an informal food exchange where it was, you know, they have chicken, so they would drop off eggs. We would make bread, make desserts, make extra. I would, I would light up the grill and I would send a text and say, hey, I got live fire. If you need anything cooked, let me know. And so they would drop off some meat and I would grill it and bring it back. And that's would, what I mean. There's, there's a lot. There's a creamy nougat center to this, this terrible circumstance. It has brought us closer together in so many ways. And honestly, I see more of my friends now than we did in the last few years because we make the time to Zoom together, to cook together, to send each other ingredients from our regions. Cappy is my Chicago connection, you know? Like people that live in different places have access to different things than, than I do, obviously, and vice versa. So we do ingredient swaps. And my friend, uh, our friends, the Klausners, Dave sent John his own sourdough starter that he's been feeding for weeks. Said, yeah, he even named it. It's Little Ian is the name of the <laughs> Little starter. Little Ian. <laughs> and it's, it's my, uh, my charge to keep Little Ian from dying. I have to feed him but every week. I have to tell you, the idea of John making sourdough bread four months ago, I would, I would have literally fallen on the floor and laughed. Well, I haven't made the bread yet. Let's not get carried away. But he yeah, says well, this week. He says it's this week. It's coming. <laughs> well, because Rachel, you've never been a, a dessert baker person, right? Uh, I mean, I can bake. I just choose not to because it turns me into a three-headed monster. Because you don't like measuring. Yeah, I just don't like It's such a drag. You know, it's yeah. too many rules. It's a very exact science. I, I like making... Um, I like making uh, profiteroles and cream puffs, gougere, that kind of thing. I don't mind that because it's you it's not easy. like making Christmas cookies. How no, cookies? Christmas cookies. The year I made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Christmas cookies and uh, all sorts of variety of ginger people and animals with different personalities. She was doing the, and, the, the decorations and snowflakes on and every the trees. snowflake was different. She was like this for hours and hours. Oh my God, ad nauseum. Anyway, I was such a shrew by the time I was done with the cookies. Nobody wanted to come to any holiday gathering that I was attending. My <laughs> sister is a wonderful baker, though. And for Father's Day, at Bella Boo's request, she made John the most insane key lime cake pie thing. It was as deep as a oh. deep dish, like a layer cake. It was so Georgia. good. It was so like I juicy. posted it. We posted it yeah. on Instagram. Yeah. And it had a macadamia nut crust. A macadamia Ooh. shortbread crust, this deep key lime, it, incredible. I, yeah, it incredible. Was, it was the best key lime pie ever. So we don't have to bake because Maria's here. John yeah. is great at frozen cocktails though, and those taste like dessert. <laughs> I've been enjoying those cocktail videos, John. Um, that's what I think is one of the lasting, hopefully one of the lasting impacts of this pandemic is that people, because we're working from home, so many of us, and it's such a privilege to be able to work from home, I just have to acknowledge that, you know, not everybody has all the free time to bake and to spend two hours making dinner. But, you know, when I'm not having to commute to work, all of a sudden I have all this free time that has allowed for a lot more creativity in the kitchen. And I saw that on Instagram immediately with people baking bread and people trying new recipes. And it was this almost this cr uh, creativity, this explosion of creativity that was happening in American kitchens because of the time that we were spending at home. So is that what you're hearing from fans, that they are- Yeah, it's, it's kind of a renaissance for everybody, you know, that they, um, they, they, they're more curious, they have more time, they're more patient in the kitchen, um, and they're more willing, you know, because their options were so limited for so many months. Yeah. There wasn't, a, 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 at least not for us, there's no such thing as takeout if you don't live in a big major city, like, do we- we had it's so expensive to, to do take out at every meal. I mean, it, and especially if people's wages are being cut or things like that. Um, and so that's the other thing that happened is that, um, you know, food banks really kicked into overdrives. I've got a story in the paper tomorrow about a local initiative that they've given away 41,000 prepared meals to people in Travis County who have been vulnerable and maybe never needed WIC or SNAP before. Um, what else are you seeing in terms of your hunger relief uh, work? I know you've been really active in that over the years. Yeah, we gave away $4 million uh, at the beginning of, of this, once we saw how long lasting and far reaching it's going to be. Um, and we tried to make sure that it wasn't redundant. 
and we divided the money between uh, humans and animals, of course, because we, we have a, a huge line of, of uh, dog and, and cat food that uh, was designed to generate money for our philanthropic uh, measures for animals. But that, the origin of that was with our brand. And since day one, our brand was dedicated to paying it forward to the next generation. We started our, Yemo was our first initiative and it was the model that we used when we started Nutrish as a, as a brand. So basically we use business and things that we would want to put out into the world anyway to generate the money for the, the works that we want to do in our community. I think that you need to make your, um, however you contribute your, your service or contribute to your community has to be personal. For us, uh, obviously food was an easy choice for me. So the uh, original initiative was designed as a platform where we would spend roughly equal amounts of money on hunger relief, school food improvements and initiatives and lobbying, you know, spending some of our funding there and then funding scholarships for public school kids that wanted to go into any food related field, providing them scholarship dollars. Um, over the last, I don't know, what would you say five or six years? Most all of our- Yeah, five or six years. Most all of our money has become relief funds for natural disasters. And it's probably started with Sandy. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, from Puerto Rico to Houston to, not only natural disasters, but now the pandemic and government shutdowns. I mean, we've we've really become a, a a large relief fund. So our discussions have changed a lot from what we can do to lobby and how we can push through this bill or that bill or that initiative. We still do some of that, but moreover and more so, we look at how we can release funds and not duplicate the work and cover as many communities as we're concerned about. So replacing school food in rural areas and um, districts of large metropolitan areas that are otherwise food deserts where the only food security was for that child, the access to school food. That is very important. How, which partners are we gonna work with to do that? Then the elderly who are specifically feeding people that are trapped or, or scared and, and don't have access to food who are at the highest risk, 65 and over, how are we getting them food? So when we sat down at the beginning of this, no, no, don't eat that, Bella, please. Bella, Bella she, she, give her her keys. Uh, she's about to lose her uh, baby doggy teeth, so she chews on everything. Rocks, sliding glass doors, furniture, she chews on everything. Anyway, so we spent a lot of our time when, when this first started, uh, where we were going to place our money and with which partners. Um, uh, World Central Kitchen, Jose, we've, we've worked with a ton. Uh, no Kid Hungry, of course, Feeding America. I mean, but we've worked with large and small, every shape and size. And we're just trying to get whatever funds, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the needs, of course. But you know, we're trying to do our part to pay for it to the next generation because John and I, we don't have human children. We have, you know, rescue dogs. So we want to do something to contribute to society and to the next, to the next generation. Well, and you're using so that's, that's the way we try and do it. But um, yeah, we're, we're working right now on, you know, some more fun projects we can do. Maybe a kid's cook along camp uh, in, in August, or we could get kids into the kitchen um, you know, we keep, we keep trying, we keep trying. That's, that's all you can do, but yeah. it's, it's, it's fun to give your work context and, and, and content and to try and make it as community oriented as possible. That's supposed to be another one of the lessons that we take from this, I hope, is finding our humanity and our sense of community. Thinking about the food supply chain, you know, yeah. where, how do we, um, rescue food that, you know, was otherwise going to go to restaurants? How do we divert that to, like here, this you know, AISD ended up, they, they changed all of their kitchens into community kitchens and they were sending home meals for the caregivers and the students, even though the schools were closed. And they did that every day for the rest of the school year. Those school lunch heroes you have been uh, talking about. 
Yeah, there, there's so there's so many creative solutions. So many chefs, and Jose Andres is a great example, have led the way in showing people how to convert their businesses to basically community care, community kitchens. Amazing. But it's so important, you know, especially for kids. There are so many places all over the country where the only access children had and their only level playing field to good nutrition was their access to school food. That's why I've been fighting for over a decade now to give kids access to school food 12 months a year. It should be a program that never goes away because there's so many kids, it's the only, only meal they get. Well, and you know, snap cards still aren't accepted at all grocery retailers. For oh, snap has been attacked. The program has been attacked uh, uh, grotesquely for the I mean, last few years, and, and they keep they keep changing the rules and moving the bar to to kick more and more uh, people in need away from good food that would not only keep them alive, it would keep them employed and uh, keep them in school, help them think better, lower healthcare costs in the future. I've never understood the policy of not investing in, in mothers and kids that, that need good nutrition. It, it's just stupidity. It, it, it doesn't make good political sense. I don't care what party you're in. And it saves money in the long run. Absolutely. Like, uh, of uh, of healthcare costs uh, and, uh, you know, it, it changes everything. Having good nutrition in a young person's life is a necessity. Can't and it's a human it right. You should be able to have health care. You should be able to have access to good food, period. In the richest country in the world, period. And I think you should be able to spend SNAP money for like curbside and food delivery. You know, just because you're using SNAP dollars doesn't mean you should be- Of course. Of course. Yeah. And you know, there's so many of so many layers of that program have been attacked in the last several months. It's just heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. She's yeah. got to down that entire energy of your fancy glasses over there. Well, we are going to take questions um, here in a oh, few good. but I definitely wanted to bring up, you know, it, it, this season, I, I keep calling it a season because I'm thinking about not just spring and transition into summer, but there's an awakening that's happening. You know, we've been talking about the food supply chain, but we're also talking about food equity and food justice and social justice and all of the protests and the Black Lives Matter movement. There's an intersectionality with food that it's been kind of crazy to watch, you know, things like Aunt Jemima. All of a sudden we're seeing a, a you know, announcement that they're not going to be carrying that logo or even name anymore. Eskimo Pie, uh, Mrs. Butterworth. Um, tell me about some of this awakening that has been happening within your I world. Think that the, the, uh, the larger um, discussion is that we are all feeling vulnerable because of what happened during this um, global pandemic. When we were all finally vulnerable and kind of brought to our knees, this horrible murder happened. And it happened in a very public way and everyone could watch it and see it with their own eyes. I am 52 years old. I have never seen anything like this in, in my lifetime. I have seen lots of protests that uh, unfortunately came and were news for a couple of months and then it, it disappeared. I, I think that there is true change happening now. And I think that everybody needs to be dedicated to it in a new way, even beyond the marches, which are beautiful, every age, all around the planet earth, um, everyone marching in, in allegiance and, and um, it's it's just it's so moving to me. I've cried a hundred times. It's given me chills. Uh, it, it's lifted me up. It has given me true hope. But you know, I've learned several things. First of all, if you have a platform, you must use it. It is your absolute responsibility. We've tried to do that on our own platform. I know people look to me for what to make for dinner, but I had very serious conversations with someone who I admire very deeply, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist Tremaine Lee. Into America is his podcast. He's an MSNBC reporter. He did an absolutely riveting special um, with Don Cheadle, uh, uh, Brittany Packnett, like just a star studded, stellar panel. Huge, great discussion. It was so riveting to me. But I think everybody needs to use their platform to encourage furthering the conversation and to learn and to listen and to ask important questions. Uh, we also used our platform to promote literature that was substantive for children during this time. Uh, to open a discussion and have people understand that even though I cook for a living, 
I'm a human being and I care about my fellow Americans and we should all be talking about this. And I think food is a great vehicle to talk about any social ill that we have. But I love that you're talking about how this is all systemic. It does all tie together. The people that are most susceptible to COVID are people that live in poor communities that are already suffering from poor air quality, poor water quality, and poor health because they eat too much processed food and they don't have access to great nutrition. So all of these things come back to interweave. And that's why I say it's such a kick the can down the road not to invest everything you can in education and great nutrition, giving people access to delicious, healthy food and access to top education on a public level. Everybody gets equal access to that should be the most basic thing because that's how you improve everything, everything. All of the healthcare costs of the future, every social issue that we have, uh, most of our healthcare issues, you improve all of that when you improve education and access to good nutrition. So I, I, I learned something fantastic by talking to Tremaine. He said, I said, you know, people get frustrated because even if it passes through the House, it gets stalled in the Senate. They say, I do vote, but it's not doing anything. So they, they go to their friends of color and say, what should I be doing? Well, A, you should be doing your homework and educating yourself on what it is you're voting on, who it is you're voting for, and not just for president, but for every single thing that's happening locally. But Tremaine said something so simple and so true. Pick one thing that you care about, one issue that is completely central to who you are as a human being, and follow that one issue. Read every single thing you can on it. And since all of these things are interconnected, inevitably it will intersect with everything else that's wrong in the, in the world today. If you could just find one thing, one thing that you're really spirited about and everybody was socially responsible for following that one thing, we'd all come together and know more about what we're voting for and who we're voting for. And in my own journey of sort of trying to unpack all of this, the sad thing is, is that racism is involved in every aspect, you know, if you're talking oh, about absolutely. welfare. But you have to be able to face right. that and talk about it. Yes. Absolutely. And it takes, um, you know, watching, watching these documentaries, listening to these podcasts, listening to, you know, influencers on in Instagram and Twitter. And talking and to each other. And talking to each other. You know, food is a great thing because it brings people to a table and it, it, it takes down their barriers and their walls. And that's what I love about music. And that's what, uh, you know, draws me to both of those worlds and why I'm happy I'm married to a, a musician. What I love most about being in Austin is that it combines the love of, uh, you know, food and the love of music and people are just really social there and able to talk with each other, even if they disagree, uh, be, because they, they've got their, they don't have their back up, they have their walls down a little more. That's not to say there's not social strife in Austin or any other community in America. Of course there is. But I'm just saying we can all use what, what we do for a living or what our talent or passion is to, to open ourselves up to our community members that we have nothing in common with as much as just the four people that you love to hang out with because they agree with you about everything. You know, you can use your skills in life to talk to strangers in a right and responsible way. And, you know, I think that continuing to educate ourselves, no matter what age you're at, is important. You have to be willing to learn and to listen for the whole of your life. I think that that is a real tragedy that you, some people tend to just kind of shut down and think I'm set in my ways or I'm not going to change my mind about that. I mean, that's a sad, that's a sad thing. That day should never come as long as you're of, of full mind, you know. And learning how to sit in that discomfort, you know, not knowing when there's so many things that are uncertain right now about when we're going to go back to work, when think what, what is, what is normal even going to look like when this is all totally is different. over? What does that even mean? You know, uh, you know, again, I've learned so much from working this way. There are elements of this I'm going to try and keep with me, even if I do go back to a studio and who knows where I'll be in a couple of years. If what I end up doing ultimately is a lot more like this than what I used to do. I think we're all, and so many of my friends with restaurants have had to completely rethink their business, not just trying to feed their community, 
but rethinking the structure of their business when they go back and, and changing everything, their menus, their ideas, their marketing, the way they connect with customers and how, because we have to find different ways to make those businesses profitable. So those folks can stay you know, in business, but they have to rethink the, and restructure and retool everything because you can't get the capacity you used to. I've had so much fun cooking the meal kits from restaurants where, you know, it's like, well, we can't yeah. serve, but we're going to yeah. send you all the ingredients that you can make at home. And then I'll watch a cooking video with a chef. And then there's that. I do that with my friends. That's how I Zoom cook. I send them the whole thing in a box and then we cook along. It's very cute. I make my own. <laughs> it, it makes it, it, it's a form of entertainment. You know, people think cooking is drudgery. Yes. Um, if you can add an element of fun to it, it, it can totally change your perspective on it. Yeah, um, I love it. It's super so fun. And I love doing it on, on, that's what I like about doing IG and cooking the way we cook now for the daytime show, because people see pretty much every second of it. And it really is like a sing-along. It's so fun. <laughs> sing-along. Okay, so we have some really great questions. I'm going to pull out a couple of these. Um, Melissa Sams has asked us for both of us, what's our go-to meal during this time and what items are always in your pantry? You should build your pantry based on um, your favorite uh, genre of, of cooking. Like we eat a largely Mediterranean diet. So I have pastas, grains, um, dried beans, canned beans, lots of tomato product, canned fish, that kind of thing. Uh, John's favorite meal, as you know, Addie, we've discussed this before, is uh, carbonara. I don't have a favorite meal. And I eat very seasonal. Um, like I, you know, a friend wants to do a cook along next week and she desperately wants spaghetti and meatballs. I'm like, oh, in 90 degree heat, really? <laughs> I mean, I'll do it because that's what they want. And it, the, that's the fun of it is, is showing somebody how to make something they love. But I would never make spaghetti meatballs in the summer. In the winter, I love spaghetti meatballs. So- well, uh, I'm making a bunch of pizza. That's, I'll buy- Yeah, I love pizza. We, all the mozzarella at the store, even though it heats up the house. You guys have a killer pizza oven too, by the way. Yeah, a pizza oven, but talk about heating up the house. <laughs> my back that that day the last time we used the indoor pizza oven i think we're going to do grilled pizza a lot more this summer the last time we used this pizza oven it runs 800 to a thousand degrees and i started work at a quarter to five and i wrapped that day at 11 at night and we had 52 pieces of tape and 36 food setups the pizza a thon that i did here almost killed me <laughs> so i think i'm gonna take a break from the big pizza oven <laughs> I feel early fall, but grilled pizza, I love this time of year. It cooks in no time. Good tip though, I put the pizza on the grill, close the lid, fine. The bottom gets nice and crispy. The top doesn't get that bubbly brown that I like. So I pop it under my broiler just for two seconds when I bring it in and it gives it a really nice finish. Nice. Um, so I'm going to combine two questions here. This is from Eric Incisio and um, Eileen Frudenhaulit, if I can say that correctly. Um, so Eric had wanted to know, describe your typical day and how food fits, you know, with COVID. And then Eileen wanted to ask about nutritious meals and like wellness during this time. So, I mean, I just kind of want to graze all day because I'm home. Like how, how are you taking care of yourself? Um, we have, we have, uh, we have uh, like a little mini gym in the cellar. We have uh, treadmills and uh elliptical and like a like a sit-up station kind of thing john has a, a bench um so but you know quite frankly some of the days have been so long we just go to work uh we very helpfully uh you know lots of seafood lots of produce we eat what, what we've been showing and sharing with everyone um some grilled food and all that uh normally in the morning john has greek yogurt uh, we have a friend who is discovered a talent in the last four months. He's uh, really, really, really good at making granola. So he sends us his granola blends. Uh, we just got two new ones today. So John will have uh, sort of like the European plan. Uh, I put some fresh fruit of some sort and a drizzle of acacia honey on Greek yogurt with a little, <laughs> the little granola. And that's John's normal breakfast. On weekends, I make uh, much more elaborate brunches. My favorite of those is I made a seven layer rolled Japanese omelet that was crazy um, and a uh, uh, grilled asparagus um, with sesame. Uh, that was a pretty, pretty awesome brunch. 
But we also make like, you know, McMuffins, um, models, uh, bakery, um, I don't know if it's Model or model, but it, M-O-D-E-L. And they're, uh, I think they ship from Connecticut. Anyway, they're these delicious English muffins that are actually a ciabatta base recipe. And the baker told me she cooks them in ghee. Like, I don't know how heart healthy they are, but they are crazy good. So some days I just make John, you know, Canadian bacon, American cheese, and an egg on that with some hot pepper jelly. And mm. he loves that. But mostly he's a yogurt, fruit, granola guy. Um, I don't really eat much uh, during the day. I drink it a lot of water. I drink cocktails as soon as John starts making them. This one, he got really lazy. This is now a mushy, uh, very lightweight um, seltzer water and... Uh, lime and vodka, uh, but John usually makes uh, you know some sort of fun cocktail. But I drink um, a good mug full of coffee, and then I have an iced coffee later in the day. I always have a hummus and some chopped vegetable salad in the fridge if I get snacky. But I'm I'm working every day, like I'm prepping stuff for what whatever it is I'm I'm making for shows that day, or IG. Or my family. Like today, we're going to do a cook along with friends that's seafood based at eight o'clock tonight. My mom and my sister would not care for that dish. So my sister wants chicken schnitzel. I have to see if my mom wants chicken or eggplant schnitzel, but I have to make them schnitzel when I'm done with my, my calls this afternoon. And then I'm going to do the prep pictures for my friends that are doing the cook along later. So I make a bunch of meals all day. Well, and cooking okay, is exercise. Just, when you're on your feet, moving around, lifting pans. Oh, yeah. I, I carry out a, 100 bags of garbage a day. We break down boxes every day. I carry stuff in it. Yes, I am on my feet and moving literally all day and all night. And I do all the laundry. I iron all the sheets. John does the floors. Like, we clean the house from top to bottom every few days. Uh, I strip all of the beds and iron all that stuff and put it all back on and you know, I mean, there's a lot of work, D you know, domestic work is work. It is a workout. This, this is no joke here. <laughs> well, and you, you know, your day has purpose. I think that when the, especially early on in the shutdown, I, you know, you kind of lose, I would lose track of the days a little bit. Um, I don't know. But then once I started to sort of wake up every morning and remember like, why am I here? What am I, what am I really here on this earth to do? Um, it gives me a little bit of a guiding sense of what my day is going to look like rather than just Netflix and sleepy time on the couch. Uh, I enjoyed my my 36 hours of, of Ozark, though. I have to tell you, <laughs> I watched the, this third season. I watched literally all in one, like, <laughs> my eyes are bleeding. My husband was crying. He's like, honey, can't we just go to bed? It's like three o'clock in the morning. I'm like, there's only one left. <laughs> I have gone down a couple of those rabbit holes, I have to admit. <laughs> well, you got to moderate, moderate the moderation, like I say. <laughs> um, so uh, Xavier Ramirez said, half of Yemo is dedicated to animal welfare, uh, COVID relief efforts. What are we not thinking about when it comes to pets during the pandemic? Uh, well, that's a really layered question, a really layered question. A lot of folks, like, my friend Jose started handing out human with the human food, our food, because we got a, a matching donation from the people that manufacture my nutrition. They committed 4 million extra meals for animals. And we use the um, World uh, Central Kitchen as the kind of the delivery arm. So if people were standing in line to get assistance for humans, a lot of folks were saying when they got to the head of the line, can you help my animals? Can you help me? People are having, because they're so strapped for money, what do you do? You feed your children or you feed your furry children? You're, it, it, they're very, very torn. When people are financially stripped, it's very hard to care for animals properly, just like it's very hard to care for people properly. So uh, the, the reason we put equal amounts into the relief efforts for humans and animals is because so many families are struggling with not only food for that day, but this could go on for months and months and months and into next year. They need that long-term security to be able to go back and redeem um, 
you know, coupons or whatever. They've worked out a little system now with our friends at Smuckers who produce the food so that the families that get the assistance food from Nutrish also get vouchers so they can continue to get it for several weeks. And I think we all have to be aware that there's a lot of our communities that have kill shelters still in them. And that's not because they're bad people that, you know, have dreams about murdering little dogs and cats. It's because fiscally they feel that the community can't handle the burden. So if you do live in a community and they're large and small all over the country, that's where this dog came from, was from a kill shelter. See if you can foster. If you have extra time and you are working from home um, and, and you do have it within your heart and your capabilities, foster. Foster an animal to save a life, you know? I have said for decades, and I know it to be true, having an animal in your home it makes you a better human. It just does. It makes you more patient, compassionate, and you understand what true empathy is um, when you bring an animal into your home. You and just, you're, you're, more, you're a more full human when, when you, you let animals into your life. And if you're having to quarantine and not be around people, you know, and, and maybe you're older and, and your only companion is an animal and you're wondering how you're gonna feed that animal, like that, that becomes an equity issue too, that, uh, you know, everybody should have a right to that companionship, not just people who can afford it. Yeah, and if you are helping your community and donating food or your time, donate animal food and people food, you know, or if you're, if you're driving around delivering meals to people that need them, who can't get out, ask if they have an animal that they're trying to care for too. Um, you know, little things like that. Like if you're already out there trying to figure things out and help, people out, if you have it to give it, think about sharing it with animals too. Yeah. So Nicole and Nadav had two questions that kind of balanced. Um, Nicole wanted to know about making tasty and balanced meals with limited ingredients. And Nirav wanted to know about, um, you know, if you are suffering from food insecurity, how can people be more efficient with their food? So I think that kind of gets into your, you know, the pantry cooking. Uh, if you only have maybe one vegetable and one bean and and, and maybe a pasta or something. How do you make that interesting? Yeah, when you bring home all vegetables, I tell people this all the time though, whether it's uh, fruit, like John and I don't eat an enormous amount of watermelon. So I, I cube up, we get way more than what we're gonna need that day. Uh, whether it's uh, peas, asparagus, watermelon, corn, if something is on sale or you cannot normally get it, bring home more than you need, blanch it, or cube it up and freeze it on cheat trays and put it in your freezer. Every time you get a product that you know you eat a lot of, boneless, skinless chicken. First of all, if you knew how to bone and skin your own chicken, which you can watch online from a variety of sources, um, I'm probably even up there somewhere doing it on Food Network or something. Uh, anyway, uh, butchering, uh, basic butchering skills can save you some money, but if you buy boneless, skinless chicken breasts, pre-portion them, as I was saying, keep them in the freezer. Whenever you make any soup, sauce, anything liquidy that you can freeze, make double and leave it in your freezer. That way you have a go-to the next time around. Uh, and don't waste anything. Like you can do something with anything, literally. Uh, when I bring home corn, I boil the cobs so that when I make corn chowder or corn soup or corn pasta, I have that delicious corn liquid um, to work with. Uh, canned beans are delicious and nutritious. Uh, you know, I don't think not, maybe more so in Texas. I think in Texas, probably people use a lot of beans in their cooking because you've got the whole Tex-Mex vibe going on. But um, I think they're really underappreciated. They're cheap and they're a blank sheet of paper. You can make them taste like anything. Um, Plant-based meats, I I've, I've become obsessed with Impossible. It is so delicious. Is ground product the best? Oh my God, it's incredible. Yeah. I make meatballs with it. I have their meatballs in my freezer. I use it for burgers. I can turn it into tacos. And you know, that's another thing. You don't need a ton of ingredients. Who doesn't love hard shell tacos or just grilled steak or grilled fish or grilled shrimp? with lime and, and a, a, a quick homemade salsa on some tortillas. It doesn't have to have a, a you know, a, a, a 
the list this long of ingredients, especially this time of year, chicken paillard with any kind of salad on it. Hi there, Peanut. You want to come to mama? You want to come here? You want to go outside with dad? Go, there's dad. Look, he just went. He just went without you. Go. No, you want to come over here? Come on. One of the most loved animals in this whole country, I would say. She doesn't know where she wants to go. Well, and with meat prices going up, you know, I'm a big fan of using a little bit of meat to, as the flavor, you know, for. Oh, yeah. We do make your own takeout ramen bowls. I make tons of ramen bowls, noodle bowls. Yesterday, I made a cold noodle bowl um, with sliced chicken, a cold sesame noodle with a sliced smoked chicken. Smoked anything is great to have because it, it, it comes cry back. You can leave it in the fridge, you know, for weeks. Uh, That's in satisfying in your belly oh. and also dried beans you know um when this all first happened everybody you know dried beans grocery store shelves were bare from dried beans so people were cooking them for the first time um and it, it's a lot cheaper than the canned and but if you cook a whole bag of beans you're gonna have extras and you're gonna need to freeze them or yeah you make black bean soup and put some in the freezer and, and you can use it for a black beans as a side dish to your tacos and black bean dip for snacking and black bean soup and you could add chorizo to the soup or smoked chicken to the soup. I mean, it's just about challenging yourself and think of it more as a game, you know, like as if you were on a game show and you have to use up all of this thing, what can you do with that thing? But yeah, we use meat, as you said, as, a, as an ingredient. We do lots of stir fries and curries um, and, tacos and things like that, where you're eating very little meat and a lot of vegetable. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we'll, we'll do two more questions and then we will say farewell. Um, someone asked, do you think that home cooking will become more popular after the pandemic and what opportunities are there in this sector? And I think the latter half of that, I think we all want to see cooking continue, people be in love with cooking for as long as possible. What opportunities do you see, uh, you know, in the next few years related to that? I think people are really going to get into the holes, just what I was describing, what I do with my friends now, the, the cook-alongs and the zoom-alongs and programming that looks and feels like you want to be a part of that thing. Like a, a different sort of blue apron or, you know, one of those meal kit things. It's, it's a much different thing to take the ingredient list, go get it, and then literally cook along with someone and you can have these Zooms now up to like a thousand people, maybe more, I don't know. But it's really fun and it's it's addictive. So I think you're gonna see programming that looks and feels more like what we've had to learn to do during this time. I think people like it because there's an intimacy about it. And it's 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 fun. It's like it's like a party game, you know, it's it's cool. Uh, and I think the same thing will happen. In fact, I was just asked to do a cooking video for a video cookbook that's being assembled by Jacques Pepin, his foundation. Um, everybody's, you know, contributing a, a video recipe to make a virtual cookbook. So I think you're going to see a lot of that interaction. Uh, and just like I felt about meal kits, if it gets people into the kitchen, I think learning how to make more of your own food is an emotional um, plus for people. I, it, it allows them to focus it's, it's great for young people's self, sense of self-esteem. And it feeds your soul as much as it feeds your stomach to be able to provide for yourself and for your friends and for people that you care about. You get a lot more out of food that you make than you do food that you take. You know, like a takeout is not going to make you go, to, you know, you may say, well, that was delicious, mm -hmm. but it's not gonna fill your soul the same way actually preparing something. You're like, man, I did that. Wow, that's fun. That's an extra layer of cool. Uh, yeah, and I do think that it brought more people to the kitchen, certainly. Uh, and I think people are getting a little more adventurous. They're not taking themselves so seriously in the kitchen, which is fabulous. I think they're having more fun in the kitchen, uh, which is great, because I think there was a time there where people like were taking it very, very seriously. And if they were gonna go into the kitchen, it had to be like game on and hardcore. It doesn't have to be that way every day. It could just be fun. You're just making a taco or whatever, you know? Well, so, I think a friend who, sell, who makes the granola, I also see, <laughs> that light just went out again, um, that there are business opportunities. Cottage Law um, could allow your friend okay. to actually start a granola business. Um, you know, especially, I just did a huge list of black owned food businesses in Austin that is growing. 
it's growing so fast. Um, and, and a lot of those started as just home projects that people were like, I want to make my grandma's ginger elixir from the Caribbean. And now she's selling that and delivering it to people. And it's a whole new, we don't have anything like that sold in Austin. I really think that people, and even my friends that have restaurants, they're rethinking ways to make money and to bring food and in, in their expertise of food and beverages to a, a, a new and different audience. So there's an enormous opportunity for people that want to start a, a small business. Absolutely. Um, okay, last question, and then we'll sign off. And we've kind of touched on this, but, um, you know, when you think about the before and the after, what do you hope to see? What, what, what aspects of this life right now do you want to uh, hold on to going forward? Uh, I want to figure out a way to take more of the vibe of what we've done here and incorporate it into a studio show um, when that day comes. Uh, I actually want to sit down and really collect my thoughts about what the last six months have taught me because it was a lot and catalog that that part of my life and the food uh i've i've really um grown in a lot of ways and and i've experienced a lot in the last few months so i want to i want to take time to write that down somehow do you think that uh, might influence your next book maybe I, and I definitely want to do the laundry list of things I thought I was going to do when I came up here in March and thought we'd be here for a while. You know, in your mind, you're childish about it. And you're like, woo, early summer vacation. Oh, we go snow day. You know, oh, what am I going to do? I'm finally going to read those 12 books. And I'm finally going to learn how to become a proper artist with paints and brushes instead of brusher, br brush markers, you know. Um, so I do hope that at least maybe before the summer ends, I, I get one proper watercolor done. I get on a drum kit at least once and I pick at least one of the three languages I half speak <laughs> and try and get a little better at it. I hope that I do anything that furthers my education in some way in, as an artist, a mu musician or a linguist. Um, but long term, I want, I want the rest of my life's work to be more like um, what the last four months have been like for me and what I've learned since I got here. Working so closely with John every day. I mean, you guys have always worked closely together, but you know. I no, he didn't really. He would work downtown in our offices. Uh, you know, John is a lawyer by day and a rocker by night. So he, he would split his time between working on his music and working in the office. And how do you think business, our business is going to change after this? Well, was the question, you know, what, what do you see looking into the future? Well, people seem to really like the, even though we're farther away and everyone's separated, this is a lot more intimate than the daytime show, which is in, uh, you know, it's in a beautiful studio, but it's still a studio. It's not Rachel's home. And everyone, you know, on social uh, for years have been asking what, what's it like at home? Did they really want to see behind the curtain as it were? How do you think our business will change though? Um, I think, uh, well, I mean, the obvious things is going to be a lot more online purchases uh, of our products. Um, I don't think, I mean, the core, our core businesses are, um, I think they're things that you need in the house. I don't think that's going to necessarily change. People are going to still need dog food. They're going to buy uh, pet food. People still need pots and pans. Um, so I don't think that's going to change. It's just how people consume it is, is what's going to change. Do you think you know, you'll probably work from home a little to, bit more? Yeah, I think people, it's going to be more online, uh, like everything else in the world. Yeah, and just this era, you know, you had mentioned just the importance of listening and uh, in that Tremaine Lee uh, interview, and it's just there's this time of awakening, you know, and I hope that this... I, this, I am that very well, interested. Will. I'm very interested in developing programming along that vein that we are united by more than we are divided. And to use um, food in my case uh, and, and friends and their talents to gather people of different backgrounds to a common table where we can openly discuss, kind of like LeBron's barbershop kind of vibe, you know, where we sit and have real conversations and we use food to bring us together, uh, or you know, if John was there, or friends of mine that play music, music and food, 
we, we use our talents to try and bring each other together, but we purposely bring a group of people together with many different views and backgrounds and force that conversation to try and spark and inspire people to do that in their own communities. I'm very interested in developing programming like that. So I, I'm gonna try and work on that as well. Uh, I'm back. <laughs> the, uh, you know, you guys have always done that with that, the feedback party, you know, the, the music, musical guests you would bring in always came from such different backgrounds and um that was such a neat all over the world yeah, yeah from all over the world and so now that'll just be happening more online and i'm really looking forward to it so um with that i'm gonna say farewell and uh, bring back monica sack from south by southwest i hope to be there. i hope we're all together again yeah, i hope we'll be there next south by southwest of course